Okay, so we are live now. Um, I think for the most part we're here, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, our intro team, Sanjana, Andrew, Pan, and Grant. Um, you can go ahead and get started. Tracy Drain is a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. She's currently the lead flight systems engineer for the Europa Clipper. Mrs. Drain was originally interested in astronomy, but chose to pursue engineering in college. Mrs. Drain received her bachelor's degree in mechanical at the University of Kentucky and her master's degree from Georgia Tech. Her career brought her space related endeavors at NASA, where she worked on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter at NASA Lab launch and the Kepler and Juno missions. As the Elite Flight Systems Engineer, she's currently working on the Europa Clipper mission, which will conduct a reconnaissance on Jupiter's moon Europa in 2024, as well as working on a mission to the asteroid Psyche, a minor planet known for being one of the largest asteroids in the belt, as well as a possible protoplanet core. Uh, in addition to her scientific career, Mrs. Drain is involved with science and film, promoting the movie Hidden Figures, speaking about women in film and engineering at the Sloan Film Festival, and acting as an exchange consultant for the National Academy of Sciences. She's also a two-time winner of the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal. An avid learner, Mrs. Drain is heavily involved in the STEAM com community and loves to explore the wonders near and far that surround us every day. So without further ado, let's welcome Mrs. Tracy Drain. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and launch into this presentation. And I know we've got about two hours. I'll try to keep the presentation part to about an hour, and then we'll have plenty of Q&A at the end. But I think we've talked about if you guys have some specific questions about the slides that I'm on, and it would be easier to hear the answer for the slide, then the folks who are moderating the questions are free to interrupt me, and then we can do those along the way, and then just have a little bit less time for our general Q&A at the end. So here we go. I should share my screen before I actually start that presentation. Ooh. Okay, so you guys should be able to see my screen. I'm going to start the slideshow. Can someone confirm for me that you can see the first slide? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. So here we go. I'm going to tell you about my own personal journey, journey along with the spacecraft, to uh, Jupiter for a couple of missions. But first, I'm going to start with telling you a little bit about my own personal path to JPL. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. That's me, little baby Tracy, with my older brother. Uh, it was great having an older brother because I was a giant nerd in school. <laughs> so it was nice having him make the other kids not pick on me. And so I was in the marching band and I did a bunch of other things, but I still had like an interest in math and science all along the way. And uh, that's my lovely mom who encouraged me and all the different things that I wanted to do. Uh, and part of that encouragement was just exposing me to things when I was young. She bought us these books these child craft books, people who are my age and older might remember those that went along with the encyclopedia set that she bought for us. And in this one called World in Space, it had a description of how scientists thought the solar system was formed. And I just found that fascinating that people could look at the clues around them today and then put together a hypothesis about how the solar system might have formed billions of years ago. Um, she was also really into sci-fi. We watched sci-fi TV shows. I loved reading sci-fi books. Um, she got me into Star Trek and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and all those great shows. And I decided when I wanted to go to school that I wanted to study engineering as a way to be part of the people who are helping to make the future look like those sci-fi shows that I enjoyed growing up. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to do an internship while I was at University of Kentucky. I had an opportunity to do internships at NASA Langley Research Center. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And then I went off to go get my graduate degree in Georgia Tech. And when I talk about the story that way, it sounds like it was really easy, right? <laughs> Along the way, I just woke up and I decided to go to college and go off and be uh, an engineering student and everything was hunky-dory, but it isn't exactly the way that the story unfolded. So I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about the behind the scenes things that happened when I was going through school. I started off even very early with a little bit of a bumpy start. This is a letter from my first grade teacher that my mom saved all these years. And I know you can't read it, but the essential gist is something like, Mrs. Williams, that was my mom's maiden name, your daughter will not stop talking in class. <laughs> like, 
no matter what I try, I stick her in a corner. She talks to herself. Like I can't get this kid to stop interrupting my class. But luckily for me, she says, she goes on to say, like, I think your daughter is just bored. She finishes her work early. She doesn't have anything to do. And so then she's bouncing around trying to talk to everybody. And so she actually recommended that they stick me in advanced classes the next year in order to give me more to uh, take my attention so that I could uh, just accelerate along faster in schools, which was great because if she hadn't done that, and if she had said, your kid is a discipline problem, we just need to, you know, stick her in a corner every day, then I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, another thing that was bumpy along the way, I was a big procrastinator, like raise your hands if you're out there and you know <laughs> that you are a procrastinator too. <laughs> I know there are a lot of us. And uh, even in elementary school, I would forget about homework that I had or just not do it until the night before. And my poor little mom would stay up until two in the morning, helping me finish up projects. And that'll, I'll tell, say a little bit more about that because I didn't grow out of that until deep into grad school. Um, but I got through school, graduated from Wagner High School, and then got to decide what I was going to go off and do with myself. And I chose to go to the University of Kentucky to study mechanical engineering. And at that time, I'm old enough, we did not have the internet. And I didn't actually have a very good idea of what I could do with an astronomy degree. So that's why I chose mechanical. It seemed more practical. I knew that in order to build spacecraft and go do things in space, you needed all sorts of engineers. And so I chose mechanical to get a nice broad foundation. I was even too chicken to go for the aerospace degree. And when I got started at the University of Kentucky, um, I hope that all of you guys are gonna be heading off to college yourselves. There's a lot of just brand new things that are coming at you in school when you're away from home for the first time, you're around lots of other students who are your age, there's lots of fun to be had as well as lots of things to learn. And that first year, especially in my chemistry class, because me and chemistry, we were not friends, and uh, I did all the things you're not supposed to do. I sat in the back of the class, I did the crossword puzzle, I just goofed around, I didn't read the material beforehand. And so, of course, I did not do well in that class. I actually ended up getting a D. Oh, and luckily for me, I got an A in everything else. And so that kept my GPA just barely above the level I needed in order to maintain my scholarship, or that would have been really bad. And so in order to stay on track, because there are some classes that they only offer in the fall and some classes only offered in the summer, I actually had to take chemistry one and two at the same time in the spring semester. But that time I had learned my lesson, so I did all the things you are supposed to do. I sat in the front of the class and I got to know the professor. I went to office hours. I did all the homework. I had study groups like I did. I did it the right way. And then I was able to get an A in chemistry one and chemistry two um, and everything turned out fine. And luckily for me at University of Kentucky at that time, and I know different schools have different policies, you could retake up to three classes, and instead of just averaging the old grade and the new grade together, they would just drop the first grade. And so now if you look at my freshman year transcript, it looks like I got a 4.0 that first semester. <laughs> it just didn't quite happen that way. And so the main lesson for me from that one is even if you stumble along the way, don't let that make you think you're not going to be capable of of achieving your goals. It just means you're gonna to have to work a bit harder, take your lessons and apply those to things going forward and just keep going. While I was at University of Kentucky, I learned that they really encourage, especially students who are in STEM areas to go do internships while you are in school, because that gives you an opportunity to see exactly what it is that the people in your field really do all day. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you wanna do something else? And I was very fortunate to land internship or co-op at the um, NASA Langley Research Center. And that was another one of those things which was a big lesson for me because I thought they would just hand us an option like here are all the things in Kentucky you can work at, like pick one and, and we'll make you go to that. But they actually said, so what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I want to work for NASA. Like, can we make that happen? And fortunately for me, they had a contact at NASA Langley's co-op coordination program, and I got to do a phone interview, and they hired me on the spot after that interview, and I started that summer, which was just way beyond my highest dreams. It was wonderful. So I got to go there and do, I think, two summers, a fall and a spring between the years of 1995 and 97. Now you can start to figure out how old I am. And one of the things I got to do while I was there, aside from just really interesting work with the engineers, is take a road trip with some other co-ops to go down to Florida to watch a shuttle launch in 1995 and then again in 97. So if you look in this picture really faintly in the background, that's actually the giant vehicle assembly building on the first trip that we took 
down to Florida. In grad school, I decided to go to Georgia Tech to get my master's degree in mechanical engineering with a focus in vibration and controls. And you would like to think that I learned my lesson from <laughs> my uh, years in undergrad and didn't have to learn anymore in grad school, but that's not true. Um, one of the things that was interesting for me in grad school was that the graduate level classes were so complicated that I had just a lot of catching up to do, I felt like, especially in the uh, controls classes. But I did the things that I had learned before. I had lots of study groups and spent a lot of extra time reading the material beforehand. And while it was hard, um, I was able to do really well and didn't have any repeat horrible grades. I got a really decent grade the entire time through. And I also did a research assistantship, which is where you, you do your own research working with an advisor. And mine happened to be with this setup, trying to put some load on bearings to see if we can detect with some accelerometers and things when they were gonna fail. My main bump in the road there is procrastination. Like I haven't talked about my procrastination habit all the way through school, but the last really bad experience with that for me was, it took me a long time to actually start writing my thesis and I was getting close to the end of the time when it was supposed to be due. And my advisor actually had to sit me down and say, okay, look, Tracy, <laughs> you're supposed to defend this thesis in three weeks. And I haven't even seen a single draft. Like if I don't have something on my desk by tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, like you are not gonna graduate this summer, which was horrifying because by that time I had actually gotten my job offer from Georgia Tech and I had, or from uh, JPL. And I had no idea if they would actually hang on to that spot for me or if I had to be late, if they would say, well, sorry about your luck and then hire somebody else. And so I ended up staying up all through the night in the computer lab because this was before we had computer labs, like typing away to trying to get all of the things pulled together from the research that I had done to that time. And fortunately, I was able to like stumble into my advisor's office at eight in the morning and hand him a floppy disk that had my thesis on it and then stand there while he thumbed through the pages on his computer and said, OK, it looks like you've got the majority of it in here. You still have a bit of work to do, but this is going to be OK. Like, get back to work. <laughs> that was terrible. That was like the worst night of my life. And it was all my fault for procrastinating. So those of you procrastinators out there, let me tell you, like, get that habit out of your system before you get to a point where it really matters for your future. Uh, okay, now I'm going to switch gears and tell you a little bit about my work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, JPL, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a federally funded research and development center. We operate uh, the lab on contract for NASA, and it's a huge place. There's about 150 buildings. It's like 177 acres. About 6,000 people work there right now, nestled in this valley in lovely Pasadena, California. And there... Our mission is to build spacecraft that go out and explore the solar system or that stay here and look out to explore the solar system in the universe. There's a variety of things that we do all the time. You guys might recognize some of these spacecraft. This is a uh, Voyager, Voyagers 1 and 2, which launched when I was a kid to go and study the outer planets. This is Cassini that orbited at Saturn for many years. Um, this is Explorer 1, the very first spacecraft that the United States put in orbit around the Earth. And many of you probably recognize uh, this little spacecraft, uh, Curiosity rover, which is very similar to Perseverance, which landed recently. So there's a couple dozen missions and development or operation at any given time at the lab. Um, I joined in 2000, and over the 20 years now that I've been at the lab, I've had the opportunity to work on a variety of things, which you heard from the lovely introduction that the gentleman gave me earlier. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which launched in 2005, I personally worked on that mission from 2001 to 2007, and it's still orbiting the red planet, I'm still sending back lots of great science data and operating as a telecom orbiter that is helping the rovers that are on the ground send their data back to Earth. Kepler, which launched in 2009, I worked on it for a couple of years and it was, the mission is over now, but it was looking out to find exoplanets in our galaxy, other planets orbiting other stars. And it has found a tremendous number of them. If you don't know anything about the Kepler mission and its discoveries, do yourself a favor and take a look, you will be amazed. And Juno, which launched in 2011, I worked on that mission for nine years actually, a couple of years prior to launch, the five year journey it took us to get out there. Uh, and for a couple of years after it got into orbit, it's still orbiting the giant planet. And I'll tell you lots more about that one. I worked on Psyche for a couple of years. It's slated to launch later next year and is gonna go visit one of the most intriguing asteroids in our main belt. Um, but I left Psyche in order to take over as the lead flight system engineer on the Europa Clipper mission, 
which is going to launch in 2024, take some time to get out to Jupiter and then uh, orbit Jupiter, but do lots of flybys of the of the really cool moon Europa. And I'll talk a lot more about that one too. So you're going to hear more in this presentation about the Juno mission and the Europa Clipper mission. Oh, and I haven't been paying attention if someone's trying to interrupt me with any questions, uh, like make some noise. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go about developing deep space missions like this at the lab. And I'll use Juno as an example. So first we start off with science questions. Scientists are trying to figure out things about either the place where we're gonna go or the place that we will observe from afar. And then we get scientists working with engineers to figure out a mission design. How can you get the information that the scientists need in order to answer their questions? Can you do a flyby? Can you do observations from way far away? Do you need to get an orbit around that body? And then more engineers get involved and we come up with a detailed spacecraft design. You need a spacecraft that has power and telecom and thermal, all the things that we need in order to keep the instruments happy and to get their data back to earth. We, and then we figure out what that design needs to be and start putting it all together uh, in a phase that we call assembly and test. Because once you launch the spacecraft, it's gonna go millions of miles away. And if something goes wrong with it, you can't exactly go whack it with a wrench and try to fix hardware. The only things you're able to change from a long distance is software. So you have to test the heck out of everything to make sure that it's gonna work. And then we strap it to the top of a launch vehicle that we did not build. <laughs> and we hope that all the engineers working on that did a great job in order to send our spacecraft on its way to where it's going. And once we get off the ground, um, it, we're in a phase called operations, and that lasts for the cruise all the way to the destination, and also when the spacecraft is gathering all the science data and sending it all back to Earth. So that's the whole design cycle for all the missions that we build. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Juno, and you'll see the next set of slides are going to talk a little bit about the science questions that that spacecraft was trying to answer, a little bit about the mission design. I'll tell you some about the spacecraft design and the challenges that we had with it. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, operations and my particular task in the ops phase. And then I'll do a slightly lighter touch of that for Europa Clipper because we're still developing that one right now. So first I'll start with some familiar facts about Jupiter. Um, anybody who has any interest in space at all is probably a little bit familiar with Jupiter because it's the biggest planet in our solar system and has a lot of really cool things going on. Number one, it has a lot of moons. These four are the Galilean satellites and I have another slide when we get to the Europa segment talking a bit more about those. Um, Jupiter has a ton of moons. Last time I checked, it has about 79 moons, 53 named ones and a bunch of them that are still waiting for names. It is an enormous planet. You can fit about 11 Earths across the middle. You can fit the Earth inside the great red spot. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about Jupiter is that it's got, it's mostly made of gas. I'll talk more about that on one of the later slides. And you can see, I thought that this was a GIF that had animations, but you can see some clouds moving one direction, some clouds moving another direction, all these swirly clouds going on. Um, it also has rings. I'm not gonna talk much more about that, but it's a nice fact to point out because when people think about rings, they think about Saturn and those gorgeous rings that are visible to the naked eye. Jupiter has some tenuous ones and actually so do the other gas giant planets in our solar system too. So what are the science questions that scientists wanted to know more about or wanted to answer with the spacecraft and the instruments that it's taking along? Uh, I talked about the fact that Jupiter is mostly made of gas. It's mostly made of hydrogen and helium. And as you get deeper and deeper under the cloud tops, the pressures and temperatures get really high because even though it's just hydrogen and helium, there is a ton of it because Jupiter is so big and it's all getting compressed under its own gravity. And as you get deeper into the clouds, you get to the point where the temperatures and pressures are so high that that hydrogen is compressed into a liquid and keep going, the temperatures and pressures get so high that the electron atoms around, or the electrons around the hydrogen atoms get squeezed off and they're free to flow around in there. And that creates an electrical field, um, which does some really cool things with the magnetic field. We'll talk about that in a second. And as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, scientists were wondering if, is there a solid core? How big is it? There's some things that they just wanted to understand about the structure. Um, back to the electrical field, our planet, the Earth, rotates once in 24 hours. That's how long our day is. But even though Jupiter is so much bigger, 11 Earths across the middle, 
it rotates once in every 10 hours. So you have this electrical field that is rotating at a pretty good clip. And when you rotate an electrical field, that generates a magnetic field. Jupiter has just a ginormous electrical field. It's so big. I think I read somewhere that even though if you see Jupiter out in the night sky, it looks like a super bright star, its magnetic field, if you could see it with the naked eye, would be about the size of the full moon. It's enormous. And it traps charged particles coming from the sun and the solar wind. And also I think that are spewed out by Io and all these volcanoes. And these magnetic fields accelerate them to near relativistic speeds, like near the speed of light, which generates a really nasty radiation field. You can almost think of Jupiter as sitting in a, in a donut of radiation where Jupiter is just kind of nestled down there in the radiation field. And unlike a regular donut, where if you're looking at the donut hole, the insides are curved kind of like this way, this one is curved this way. So you'll see later when we put Ju Juno, the spacecraft, in orbit around Jupiter, it tries to mostly go through the edge of the donut hole and miss a lot of this radiation in order to make it easier for the mission to uh, survive or for us to design a spacecraft that could survive. We still get dinged a little bit on the way in and a little bit on the way out by the radiation field. So we still had to account for that in the design. So scientists want to understand more about the structure and interior of the planet, more about this magnetic field and the radiation field and all the particles around it, and things like how deep do those storms go? We can see all these really cool storms on the surface, like the Great Red Spot and all these other storms. Do they go way deep into the planet? Do they just go a little bit into the cloud tops? Those are some of the things, and not all the things, that the scientists wanted to understand with this mission. So now we'll talk a little bit about the mission design. So I joined Juno in 2009, a couple of years before launch, and I stuck around until 2018. And to get the spacecraft out to Jupiter, we launched it in 2011 from Kennedy Space Center. And we didn't have a launch vehicle big enough because the spacecraft is enormous. You'll see a little bit more about that to send it in a straight shot all the way out to Jupiter. So we wound up going out past the orbit of Mars. This red line is the orbit of Mars. We did two huge deep space maneuvers where we fired our main engine for 30 minutes each, about two weeks apart, to make sure we were on the right trajectory to come back by the Earth two years after launch to get an Earth gravity assist boost to get going fast enough to get all the way out to Jupiter three years later. And then when we put the spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter, you can see this is what I was explaining before. We get into this orbit, this really big elliptical orbit where we spend a little bit of time close by the planet, and then a lots of time farther away from the planet, dipping through this little radiation field donut hole in order to avoid most of the radiation. Now, the gravity of Jupiter actually makes our orbit start to walk down. So we start here, and then we're here, and then we're here over about the 32 orbits that we were planning. So you can see in the later orbits, we do go through more of that donut hole. And so the spacecraft gains a little bit more radiation dose on all of the later orbits as we go through. And so we had to account for that in the design. So about the spacecraft, there were some key engineering challenges that the design had to meet. Uh, number one, high radiation at Jupiter. So we actually had a radiation vault made of titanium that the sensitive electronics were inside of, and that helps keep the radiation field that they experience way down below what it would see at Jupiter, more like what it sees at Mars, and we're totally used to designing things for that environment really far away from the sun. Jupiter is five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is, so um, there's a lot less light and it's very cold out there. And that's why we had to have these huge solar arrays. You can see these people in bunny suits for scale. The solar arrays are just a little under nine meters, um, let's see, nine meters long and a little under three meters across. And there's three of them. Uh, this one is a, is a little truncated so we can put the magnetometer out here, but we needed them to be that big in order to generate enough power for the spacecraft. And there are thermal blankets to keep some parts from getting too cold. We're a long way away from the Earth. Uh, and so we have this huge three meter antenna, which we use to communicate at the highest data rates. And there's lots of smaller antenna around too for times when we couldn't point the spacecraft carefully enough in order to use this one. You can think about it like a laser pointer. You can get really good concentrated signal out of this, but you have to hold it very steady in order to keep the spot on the receiving antenna on the Earth. But if you can't point your spacecraft that well, then maybe you need something that's more like a flashlight. This is our median gain antenna, so you don't have to point it as well, but you can still get pretty concentrated signal. Or the low gain antennas, which are more like a light bulb, and it's sending our radio frequency in all directions, which means it's getting 
much more diffuse as it goes. So we only use those when we have to be pointed way off from the earth. So highest data rate from our um, high, um, high gain antenna. And then we needed to get into orbit and do those deep space maneuvers I talked about. So there's a main engine on the backside of the spacecraft that we can burn for like our largest maneuver to get into Jupiter was about 35 minutes to get captured and also several pods of small attitude control thrusters around the spacecraft. There are lots of instruments on the Juno spacecraft and this actually should be a gift that rotates to show that the spacecraft spins in order to make sure all of the different instruments have multiple opportunities to view the planet as we're going by on those like roughly six hour closest approach passes to the planet. So lots of instruments and you'll hear about a couple of them later on. We needed to put the magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field out away from the main body of the spacecraft because since the spacecraft has electrical circuits that are running electricity through them, that generates a small magnetic field. And we didn't want to just measure our own magnetic field. So we stuck it way far away out on the end of this boom, on the end of a solar array, so that we can really measure with high levels of um, sensitivity the magnetic field around Jupiter itself. And we also use the telecom system to do gravity science. Just like you, you guys have probably heard of the Doppler effects when you hear a siren go by and the noise changes because the vehicle is moving relative to you. When we use our telecom antenna and we have it pointed at the earth, the gravity of Jupiter affects the motion of the spacecraft and it causes a similar Doppler effect which we can measure on the ground and use that in order to learn things about the structure of the inside of the planet. So solar at Jupiter, why do those solar arrays have to be so big? So I talked about the fact that Jupiter is way far away from the sun, five times farther than we are. And if you think about the light from the sun expanding like the surface of a balloon, and you drew a square on that surface and then you blew the balloon up to two times the radius, that square gets stretched. And now it has a length that's twice as big as it was and a width as twice as big as it was. And if you look at what that does to the area, you have an area four times as big as the original area. And so each small area that is the same as the original one has one quarter of the plastic that was originally here when you blew up the balloon. So you can think about that in terms of light. As the light goes out and out and out from the sun, then the light gets spread out more and more and more. And each area of the same size only gets one over the square of the radius of that amount of light. And so if you go three times as far, now this big area is nine times as big and each same size area as the original one only gets one ninth of the plastic or one ninth of the light. And you go all the way out to five times the, the radius. So five times farther from the sun, Jupiter is versus the earth. Now each little area only gets one twenty-fifth of the amount of light that you would see at the earth. And that's why these solar arrays have to be so big. If you took the Juno spacecraft and you stuck it on an NBA sized basketball court, it would pretty much stretch rim to rim. And that's all just to generate a, a bit over 500 watts of power. That's like a third of a microwave. And half of that goes to heat in order to keep things from getting too cold. And the rest of it has to be used for all the engineering components and, and all the instruments that were running out there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about an example of a task that, that a systems engineer does. Actually, I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, I mentioned that I was a systems engineer, and I'm realizing now I did not even tell you what that was. <laughs> so when you think about a spacecraft and all of the different things that are necessary to make it work, you have to have power. So we have solar arrays that um, use light from the sun and turn that into electrical power for the spacecraft. We also have batteries. So when the solar arrays can't be pointed at the sun, you're storing energy in the batteries to use. We talked about telecom, that's our way of communicating back to the earth. I talked about propulsion. We use this main engine on the backside of the spacecraft and mix an oxidizer and a fuel in order to create combustion and, and provide propulsion for the spacecraft. I also talked about little thruster pods around the spacecraft that this uses in order to control the orientation of the spacecraft. We call that attitude control. There's software that runs everything. There's a whole bunch of different things on a spacecraft that all have to work together in order to make a mission successful. A systems engineer's job is to understand enough about all of those different things and to work with all of the experts in those different areas so that as we are developing the spacecraft, we are making sure they're getting developed to work right together. And I'll give you an example. I mentioned a little bit about how 
we use the telecom, the high gain antenna in order to send the, the highest data rates back to earth. Well, that works because you have a signal that's high enough, hello, loud enough, strong enough that we can pick it up with a big antenna on the ground. The stronger your signal is, the easier it is to pick it up on the ground, but that means you need more power to run an amplifier to make your signal that strong. And a telecom engineer might say, well, if you give me 200 watts of power for my amplifier, I can have a really strong signal and we'll be able to pick it up really well on the ground. Um, but a system engineer working with a telecom engineer and power would say, well, our whole spacecraft only makes 500 watts so we can't use that much for telecom. So if we have to use less power and have a less amplified signal, but we point the spacecraft really, really carefully to get the center of your pattern right on the, and right on the, the ground station, then we'll have enough of a signal strength to be able to pick it up. So it's trades like that that we have to make. How much, how many uh, watts of power go to which thing? And if something doesn't go exactly the way we want it to in the design, why isn't it working? What can we do about it? What kind of things can we change so that overall the whole thing still works? And the system engineer job changes a lot across the course of a mission. Once we get into operations, um, lots of times things do not go according to plan. I'll talk a little bit about that. Systems engineers also need to work with all of the different subsystem experts to say, okay, what just happened based on the data that we can get back from the spacecraft? Why did that happen? Um, why didn't we know about it before? And what can we do about it given that we can't change any of the hardware? All we can do is change the software. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the main jobs of a systems engineer. One of the things that we do before we launch the spacecraft is try to come up with all the different things that could go wrong and make sure we either design them out, so change the design such that they literally cannot happen, or if they can happen, figure out what we can do about it. And a lot of times on spacecraft like these, we have two of all of the key components. So if one of them breaks, the spacecraft will automatically swap to another one and everything is fine. And so we do that, that thought process to figure out what can go wrong and what we should do about it. We call it a fault tree. And it's like, you take something that really has to work, like launch, launch needs to be successful. And then you think through what are the major ways that, that, what are the major things that have to go right so that launch is successful? Well, you need to be power stable. You need to be generating power. You need to be thermally stable. You can't have anything that's getting way too hot or way too cold. You need to have communication with the spacecraft because once it gets launched, there's a whole bunch of things we have to tell it to do. And you also need to be like on the right trajectory <laughs> in order to get to where you're going. And then we'll take each of those things and say, well, what can, what can make it not work? So let's take power, for example. Your spacecraft needs to be power stable. Well, what could make our spacecraft not be power stable? Well, maybe the solar arrays didn't deploy, that would be bad. Maybe the battery is not working. Maybe, you know, and, and you go on and on and on for those different things. And then you take each one of those, like say the, maybe the solar array didn't deploy. And you say to yourself, well, why wouldn't the solar array deploy? Well, maybe the command didn't go through, maybe the hinge broke, maybe a damper didn't work right, maybe, and you keep going and keep going. And you do that for all of these different things, which is why it ends up looking like a tree. And for each of these little things on the end, you come up with either a way you're gonna design it out or a way that the spacecraft will still be okay even if it happens. And then you have to come up with some kind of test or analysis or inspection to prove that what you just said was gonna keep that thing from happening would actually keep that thing from happening or deal with it when it does. So this is a huge pile of work that we do. And the whole reason is to make sure that we're gonna have a spacecraft that will operate and be successful. That was a lot. Did I see, did I hear a noise in the chat? Did someone have a question or no? Nope, okay. Okay, so that was an example of a system engineering task before launch. And now I'll give you an example of some system engineering tasks after launch. And so I mentioned that sometimes things don't go exactly the way we expect them to. And so we end up, those are called anomalies and we have anomaly investigations. And one of my primary jobs in operations for Juno and for MRO um, and Kepler was, what do we do when something goes wrong? And early on when we were in cruise, we had a couple of components that were much warmer than we expected them to be when we were that close to the sun. And sometimes it's really difficult to design something that can deal with being close to the sun and also really far from the sun, especially things that you want to be super cold when you're far from the sun. And we do a whole bunch of analysis and a whole bunch of testing in order to show that the design we're coming up with is, is going to be able to handle that. 
but it's complicated and sometimes things go a little bit differently from expected. So shortly after launch, we had a couple of components that were warmer than we expected. And so we took the engineering models of those, we put them in a thermal vac chamber. This is a fairly small one like this, where you can, you can see this door off to the side where you can shut it, you can suck out all the air so that it's in a vacuum like it is in space. And you can't see in this picture, but there's actually a, a window in this door where we could shine fake sunlight in there in order to really give it the space environment and investigate why it was so warm and where we are. And, with, and if there was anything we can do about it in terms of changing the spacecraft attitude or just being able to refine our models, our thermal models of those things in order to match what we're seeing now and then run the models again at Jupiter to make sure it was still gonna be the right temperature at Jupiter. And we were very fortunate that when we updated the models, we could get them to match what we saw in the, in the near earth environment and then ran the models again for the Jupiter environment and it predicted they would be fine. And lo and behold, once we got to Jupiter, they were fine. So that was good. Earth flyby was really interesting for us. I had talked about the fact that we had when we launched in 2011, we had to go out past the orbit of Mars and then come back two years later to do an Earth flyby. And that was going to be one of the few, the only time in the spacecraft at that time that we were going to put a planet between the spacecraft and the sun, meaning that there would not be any sun on the solar arrays. And that eclipse was only going to last for about 19 minutes. And we designed the spacecraft and all the settings to be able to deal with that just fine. But it turned out something, something got past us in analysis space and the spacecraft thought it had a power problem about 12 minutes into that 19 minute eclipse and turned a bunch of instruments off and like sent a call home like, hey, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> and then this was me and some of the people who were in the JPL mission support area. There was another mission support area at Lockheed Martin who was our partner for Juno. And you can see us all looking very unhappy on that day. Uh, that was the start of the investigation to figure out like, what happened, why did that happen? What do we need to do about it? And it was, it was okay because by the time you get to Earth flyby, you've already done all your trajectory correction so that the spacecraft is on the right path at the right altitude at the right time. Like it was all just physics at that point. The spacecraft didn't have to do anything to get the gravity assist, but we had all the instruments on so that we could take a bunch of measurements of the Earth and use it as a way to practice what we were gonna do at Jupiter. And we got to do some of that, but not as much because the, the spacecraft ended up turning some things off. Uh, and we learned fairly rapidly what it was that had happened, and we were able to correct that. And it gave us some things to think about as we were heading into the longer part of cruise to get to Jupiter. We adjusted some of our processes so that ops would be smoother at um, Jupiter. So it was actually, in a way, a good thing. It was a good lesson for us to learn and be able to apply that to later operations. This is great. So anomaly. Oh, yes. Go oh, sorry. Um, we have a question from Jay. Uh, yeah, they're ahead. asking, what is the process of finding out what temperature each piece of equipment needs to stay below? Is there a list of temperature limits for each material used, or is it more around the equipment as a whole? Uh, it is both, actually. That is a really good question. We have to know about the temperature limits for each, each material that we're using. Um, there's things, especially in the beginning of a mission, when things get warm or go into space, they outgas, and we have to think about what that potential contamination might do to the instruments and other things on board the spacecraft. Um, and we also do have limits for each component as a whole. We have maximum limits and minimum limits. And we also have those limits for if they're turned on, what the maximum minimum is, and if they're turned off, what the maximum minimum is, because sometimes those are a little bit different. And we do a bunch of thermal modeling. Um, there's a, a lots of different thermal programs out there. I know one of the ones that we use a lot is called Thermal Desktop. And then we do a bunch of thermal tests, kind of like I had mentioned in this little thermal chamber where we were doing a test with a engineering model where there are huge thermal chambers where we stick the whole spacecraft in there and we test it um, in a variety of temperature conditions and then use the data from that test in order to make sure that our models are accurate enough to be used in operations. Yeah, great question. Okay, any other questions while I'm paused? Um, okay. Yeah, we have a, another question from sure. Alex Y. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was asking, how do you tune parameters like gain for feedback controllers on spacecraft? Oh, that's a great question too. So we do a lot of the parameter tuning initially on the ground by some testing that we're doing, uh, some of it with components, some of it simulated. And then we update the software in order to have the right parameters in there. And then when we launch spacecraft, we usually do checkout activities where we are testing the different components and we're like calibrating to make sure that we understand where our star tracker is, for example, and that when we are trying to 
point specific axes of the spacecraft in specific ways. Like we, we run it through its paces and make sure we have all that dialed in. And um, it depends on your design of your spacecraft, but usually we try to make it easy to update the parameters where you don't have to do like a whole software build or anything like that. You can bundle them up in a configuration file and then uplink them to the spacecraft and the spacecraft will ingest that and then update the parameters that it has on board. Great questions from you guys. Okay, so that was an example of anomaly investigations. And I also, uh, as a systems engineer, um, work with the team in order to support key flight activities. And oh, I forgot I put this picture in here, yay. So these were from the actual activity of getting the spacecraft into orbit at Jupiter, where we had to burn our engine for 35 minutes and, you know, and do a bunch of stuff leading up to that in order to get the spacecraft captured by Jupiter's gravity and go into that big orbit that we were talking about. Um, this is our Lockheed Martin mission support area. You can see the Lockheed Martin sign on the back. Um, a few of us JPLers went out to be with this part of the team there, and some of the Lockheed Martin folks came to the uh, JPL mission support area. Th this is like our everyday one. If you've seen a lot of the like rover landings and things, that room where everyone's jumping up and down and saying, yay, like that was on JOI day where the JPL portion of the team was um, for this one. And because my job is mainly about anomaly investigation, I wasn't on console as one of the people like doing the nominal checks, but I was there so that if something went wrong, I would be right on the spot with the team and we could coordinate between the JPL and the, J and the Lockheed Martin teams in order to solve any issues. And happily on that particular day, everything went off like clockwork, yay. And it was the uh, 4th of July, which is why you see one of my colleagues wearing a happy patriotic hat there. Uh, everything went well that day. We did have lots of other fun things to do after that, but combination of nominal and anomalous things um, that system engineers participate in post launch. And then a couple of the things that I personally learned from my time on Juno, like I didn't tell you about the work that I did on MRO or Kepler, lots of similar things. It was just earlier in my career, so I had a little bit less responsibility, but because Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was also a partnership with Lockheed Martin, and so a lot of things about the spacecraft design, especially the software, were very similar. I got to apply a lot of the knowledge that I gained from my time on MRO um, to the work that I did on Juno. So lots of things learned about fault, our fault protection and how that works and working with the team and all the different subsystems that we talked through, what we need to do to get ready for lunch. Like it was great that I had all of that good experience from six years on MRO and two years on Kepler to apply to this job. And so I felt like uh, my confidence level was really in, in a good place because you don't want to you don't want to um, feel like you know so little that you can't be confident in what you're doing and you're super tentative. And if you're overconfident, then you'll think that you know the right thing all of the time and you might make some decisions that ultimately aren't that great. And so it was good that I felt um, dialed in in order to be able to contribute well to that team. Um, also learned a lot about making a lemonade <laughs> out of lemons. I mentioned our Earth flyby experience and how we had that, that issue that sent us into safe mode, but ultimately, it taught us some really good lessons about the way we wanted to modify our analyses of our power system and how things were operating on board the spacecraft. And so that put us in really good shape for getting in orbit around Jupiter where we were gonna be in our most power constrained scenarios that was farther, farthest away from the sun. And there's all sorts of things that happened during cruise, uh, which were lots of fun that we needed to go off and run down, which all just made us a, a tighter, smoother team for later operations. Uh, so Mrs. Drent. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Tanae who asks, how does Juno handle data compression when up slash down leaking? What do you do oh, to mitigate data loss and or corruption? That is a really great question. Let's see, there's, there's multiple different things that we do for it. Um, so data compression is important because we're so far away from the earth that you only have so much data rate that you can send. And so I think that there is data compression on some of the largest data sets, like from our imager that get compressed on board before we send it. When it comes to making sure that we can deal with data loss, this, the spacecraft has some information that it sends in metadata, which kind of explains for each packet of data, how much information is supposed to be in there. And so the ground has a lot of tools built into the ground data system that can tell when there are gaps like if, if something happened and we had a little bit of a dropout in the ground antenna and we missed some data, we know about that. And then we will request that specific piece of information to be retransmitted. And so that's how we deal with it on, on, the, on the side coming down. On the uplink side, 
when we send information to the space draft, there's also metadata information built in so that the space draft can determine um, how much information is supposed to be in there. And if it gets on board and it's missing some of that really um, key information, then it knows that it didn't get something. And so it'll tell the ground, like, hey, I didn't get that. <laughs> and we'll, be, we'll have to retransmit it from the ground too. So that's some, some high level descriptions of how we deal with that. Uh, so we have another question from Amanda. Uh, what was your favorite part of working with Juno? Was there a specific memorable moment that particularly sticks with you? Yeah, there were so many great parts. Um, I'm gonna have to give you two. I think that Jupiter orbit insertion really sticks with me because when you've been on a mission for that long, at that, that point, I joined in 2009, we launched in 2011, we put the spacecraft into orbit in 2016. You put so much of your own personal time and energy and blood, sweat and tears into something. And you're all on pins and needles because you need it to work in order to like finally start getting the science data that you need. And that whole period of time leading up to orbit insertion, there's lots of things that you're doing in the days configuring, configuring the spacecraft. It's very much of a strong bonding time with the team. And then to have it all work well like that is just super exciting. There's, there's really no comparison to uh, either a launch or an orbit insertion in terms of just like super high points on a mission. So loved that. Um, I also got to say that the anomalies are very memorable too, <laughs> because there are periods where um, it, it's like being on a roller coaster, right? Like something goes wrong and now you're freaking out a little bit, but then you get an opportunity to use all your engineering skills to figure out what happened. And it's so rewarding when you have an opportunity to pull together with the team and solve the mystery of what happened and figure out what to do about it and keep your mission on track. So those are also like really great memorable moments. And there, there are like several major, <laughs> at least they felt major to me, anomalies that happened to Juno along the way. And all of them we were able to resolve and the mission has been like wildly successful and has relatively recently gotten approved for an extended mission to do even more orbits and get even more data back. So lots and lots of great memories to choose from. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and go to Europa and we have a little bit to go through with that one. And uh, I think we're doing fine on time though. I, I probably have a good meh, 15 minutes in Europa. And since we've been asking questions along the way, I think that'll still leave us lots of lots of time for more. We're doing, we're doing just fine on time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oops, I lied. So I have, <laughs> I have this one more slide on Jupiter. So, now, it's the, so I was talking a little bit through that whole diagram I showed you before, like what are the science questions? What's the mission design? What about the spacecraft design? Talk a little bit about operations. And now um, a little bit of the science payoff. So me, not scientists. So I can't, if you have lots of science questions, I, not, I probably won't be able to answer most of them, but I can point you to where you can find the answer. And I'll tell you about a couple of my favorite discoveries. So one of the things that was really cool about Juno is that it's, it's, path around the planet goes over the poles and no spacecraft that we have sent there like Galileo back in the late 90s early 2000s or that flew by like Cassini on its way to Saturn or like the voyages that flew by none of them went over the poles and so any pictures you looked at at Jupiter are from the side with those really cool tan and red bands of the great red spot if you ever had seen one of the globes of Jupiter that you can buy the tops and the bottom look like these very fuzzy like kind of tanny gray we don't know what's up there Kind of thing. But when Juno flew over, you could see, now this, I think this, the color scheme is a little bit stretched in these images from Juno Cam, but you can see that it's a bit more purple and blue up there. And there's all these like swirly sea of storms happening. This is of the South Pole, and there are like kind of five storms around this. Um, this is a stitched together picture. You can almost see the line through here because if you imagine the spacecraft going over the planet and the sun only shining from one direction, only half of the planet is illuminated at any given time. So that's why this one's stitched together. It's a little fuzzy through here. But the camera, the, um, what is it called? The Jovian, oh no, I should have looked it up. There's a uh, auroral imager that was built by the Italian space agency called JIRAM. Um, Jovian infrared auroral, map, auroral mapper. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> they take images in the infrared. And so you don't need light from the sun. It's looking at kind of a heat map of what it can see at the cloud tops. And this picture that I'm about to show you um, is one of my favorite images like of all time from Juno, because when the scientists first put it up in a big science meeting that we had, 
all the rest of the scientists from all the other teams like stood up and burst into applause. They were like, I cannot believe it looked like that. It was so crazy. And this particular image that I picked is one that someone out in the public took and animated. And so it's not like the original one that we would have seen. The original one would have been a still picture, but holy cow, I can't even stand how awesome it is. So here you go. If you have not seen this before, oh, the animation's not working. Ah, so it just looks like a still image for you. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is what the North Pole of Jupiter looks like. There's this huge storm in the middle and these eight kind of symmetrically spaced storms around. And you can even see like these four look more like each other and these four look more like each other. A couple of little baby storms in the middle, like it's just crazy up there. <laughs> and this wasn't anything that anyone knew existed until Juno flew over and took this image with that Jerem instrument. Crazy, love it. Um, and we also, there's all sorts of interesting things that the, uh, the spacecraft has discovered since it's been there for a few now, years now. One of the things I think is cool, this is um, flying over the great red spot. This is a Juno cam image. And this, this is that bigger Juno cam image from the camera. And then the microwave radiometer is able to detect changes in temperature and other things like um, um, chemical composition below the surface of the clouds. And this goes back to that question I mentioned before about how deep do those storms go? Are they just close to the surface? Do they go really deep in? And the thing that was interesting is that this great red spot, you can see changes in temperature across the great red spot all the way down as far as this instrument can even penetrate. So down to 350 kilometers, the roots of the storm go super deep, um, which wasn't something I expected. I don't know if the, if the scientists expected that or not, but it's cool to see that confirmation that the storms go pretty deep in the atmosphere. Good stuff. Uh, so now I'm, I'm really actually going to switch gears and talk a little bit about Europa, which is a cool, pun intended, destination in the Jovian neighborhood. So a little bit of background about the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. And they're called Galilean satellites, the four biggest moons, because Galileo Galilei back in 1610 was observing Jupiter through his newly developed telescope and saw that Jupiter had these three bright thing, four bright things around it, which he at first thought were stars. But as he continued to observe them, they changed position relative to each other and relative to Jupiter or relative to Jupiter over the course of the nights. And so he realized that they were moons orbiting Jupiter like our moon orbits the earth. Um, and the four moons are actually a different gentleman, Simon Marius uh, was the one who named them. He discovered them around the same time independently as Galileo, but Galileo published first. <laughs> so Gal Galileo gets the credit for the discovery. And they are Io, which is the closest to Jupiter and is the most actively volcanic body in the solar system. It's like spewing sulfur compounds and stuff onto the surface all the time, um, like hundreds of kilometers out into space because its gravity is fairly small, I know. Uh, Europa, which is the one that we're gonna talk about a lot here in a minute. Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system. It's actually bigger than the planet Mercury. And Callisto, which is also very large and has tons of craters, way more craters even than our moon. Uh, the Galileo spacecraft was launched in 1989 and studied the Jupiter system, including these moons from 1995 to 2003, which is why we have these really cool um, close-up images of those moons. So the surface of Europa, one thing that you'll notice is that it has these huge ridges across it, like these giant, presumably cracks in the ice, like these large ridge plains that the scientists want to study more. Um, th there's this chaos region that they call it, where you can see some things have lines going this way and then lines going that way and then lines going this way as if a whole bunch of jumbled up stuff has come together. It has craters, but not that many. You'll see this is uh, one of the largest craters. It's not the largest, I don't recall uh, what the backside looks like, but there aren't that many across the surface. And this is kind of a clue that something's going on that's refreshing the surface on a relatively short scale, geologically speaking, or else it should have a lot more craters on there. And then these things, which um, are like little freckles, actually lenticulae is a Latin word for freckles. And so scientists wanna understand more about the processes that are shaping all of these things on the surface. But what's even more interesting is Europa's interior. Scientists think that Europa has a metallic core and then a large rocky mantle and then lots and lots of liquid water beneath a shell of ice. And maybe this ice shell is around 15, 25 kilometers thick. 
maybe the water layer is, I don't know, 60 to 160 kilometers. We don't know. That's one of the things that the Europa Clipper mission is going to try to understand the thickness of the ice and the depth of the ocean. And um, that's a lot of water. It looks like a thin layer here, but it's actually more water than all of the Earth's oceans combined times two. And we know that on Earth, where there's water, there's life. And uh, scientists are wondering, could Europa have all the conditions necessary for life. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But first, why do we think there's water? Because when you think about the fact that Jupiter is so far away from the sun, like shouldn't everything be just frozen solid out there? And so here is one of the clues that scientists know of, the strongest clues from, from, the, mission, from the Galileo mission pointing to the high likelihood of there being water. And it's something called an induced magnetic field. We talked about the fact that Jupiter generates this huge, magnetic field, and as the Galileo spacecraft was studying the magnetic field with its magnetometer, it discovered that around the Europa moon, the magnetic field lines were bent. And on the Earth, we actually can tell that the, the Earth's tides of the salty ocean, um, which conducts electricity, when the, when the tides, waters move around because of the pull of the moon, that actually interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and bends the magnetic field lines in something called an induced magnetic field. And so the strongest hypothesis for why Jupiter's magnetic field lines are getting bent around Europa is that there's some kind of conductive fluid, probably salty water, underneath that shell of ice. And so the next question you might have is, well, okay, but how could it be warm enough <laughs> to make all that water? And this is um, how that can happen. It's something called tidal flexing, leading to tidal heating. The orbit of Europa around Jupiter is not perfectly circular, it's a little elliptical. And so when it is closest to Jupiter, the gravitational pull of Jupiter is strongest. When it's farther away, the gravitational pull is a little bit less strong. And so when it's stronger, there's it's deforming the moon. When it's less strong, it's deforming the moon less. And that's kind of like squishing and then releasing and squishing and releasing the moon. And you can think about it like if you take a paper clip and you bend it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it breaks. And then you touch the end, you can feel how hot it is. That's the friction of the, of the molecules that get rubbed together or the material that gets rubbed together when you are bending it like that. That's what's happening on Europa. And that's what's generating enough heat inside in order to keep a lot of water liquid under the shell of ice. So now, okay, if there's water, are, the, are there ingredients there that would be enough to let um, life evolve? So more water than all the Earth's oceans combined. Scientists um, wonder if we have all the essential elements there, both from the formation of the moon and from impacts of comets and asteroids and things along the way. There's chemical energy, both from above with sunlight and below with the heat we were just talking about. And it's stable. It's been in these conditions for 4 billion years since not long after the formation of the solar system. And we know that when you, when you have those things together, then you have all the conditions that might be right for life. And on Earth, um, you guys are maybe aware of um, the hydrothermal vents way at the bottom of the Earth oceans where it's far too deep down for sunlight to penetrate because Earth has, uh, has a core that is warm and you get these hydrothermal vents, which are jetting hot water up from uh, down below the surface, there are lots and lots of life forms that have developed on Earth that can use that energy in order to drive chemical processes and have life. So there's, there's this question in people's minds, could something like that be happening down at the rock water interface of Europa? We don't know. But the, the spacecraft that we are sending has a lot of uh, instruments on it that are going to try to, to pick at some of the clues to help science put that story together. And I'll talk about that in a second. So that was the science questions that um, some of the science questions that we have that have driven doing a mission like this. And now we'll talk a little bit more about the mission design. When the spacecraft gets to Jupiter, it's not going to orbit Europa. So you remember we talked about that donut of radiation and Jupiter sitting in the donut hole. Well, the moon Europa is nicely nestled inside that radiation donut, and it is much more difficult to try to design a spacecraft that can deal with that radiation long term. So what we're doing is putting the spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter again, but then dipping into the radiation field in order to do flybys of Europa every 14 days. And so we're going to do about 50 low altitude flybys. 
Um, and I have to say, like, low altitude is, is really what we mean. Some of them are as high as about 1,700 kilometers, but the lowest are 25 kilometers above the surface. And when I first joined the mission, I was like, is that a typo? Like, <laughs> 25 kilometers are, wow, like, that's really close. So that'll give the instruments a lot of opportunity to take a lot of data about a variety of areas around the moon. The idea is that we'll space out these flybys so that we'll get global coverage and we'll do all those flybys in a little under four years in order to gain a bunch of information and then minimize our time spent in that high radiation environment. So the spacecraft, what does it look like? It has some key engineering challenges. Hopefully these look familiar because it's all the same as you saw on Juno, radiation. There's even higher radiation that this spacecraft is gonna accumulate than, than Juno did because we have to go through a, a fairly hefty part of the radiation field to go by Europa every single orbit. A long range to the sun, so the spacecraft is also enormous. It's about 30 meters across, a long way away from the Earth, so we have a large high gain antenna again, and we have to get into Jupiter orbit. Instead of having one large main engine, though, this spacecraft uses a lot of uh, reaction control thrusters and, and does a long burn. This burn is going to be like multiple hours long instead of half an hour long in order to get Captured. And similarly to Juno, we have a magnetometer and we put it on the edge of this long boom instead of sticking it on the edge of a solar array to get it away from the spacecraft's fields that it's generating. And for, for trying to determine the thickness of the ice and understanding the water down there, we have a radar and these antennae are about 16 meters long and those are attached to the solar array. So lots and lots of different instruments on the spacecraft and I might have a slide in there later on about those. This is strange. Um, so, uh, yep, go ahead. Uh Sorry, uh, but in regards to uh, the atmosphere again, we have a question mm -hmm. from Conchina asking, uh, sorry, uh, could the carbon dioxide and oxygen that have been detected in Europa's atmosphere have a biological source? If not, where, where is it from? Yeah, and that's one of those science questions that yours truly has no clue, like I got nothing. <laughs> but I know that um, because there are plumes on Europa where you have like little ice water volcanoes and, and things are coming out of the moon, we have instruments on board that are gonna be trying to determine the composition of those things. And if we're lucky and we end up going through one of those tenuous you know, um, vapors from the plumes, we might be able to determine like exactly what kind of chemical composition is in there. But yeah, I, I personally have no idea <laughs> what scientists think of the source of what is there now. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, we are going to Jupiter, still got to go big with the solar arrays. We're kind of hanging off the edge a little bit of uh, NBA basketball size court now. Um, huge solar arrays, they're gimbaled, so we can angle them to point them at the sun. And unlike Juno, which had mostly electric heaters, this spacecraft uses a heat redistribution system where we've got little um, lines full of refrigerants that run around the parts of the spacecraft that are going to get really hot, like the avionics vault and then use that in order to distribute that warm fluid around to the prop system and keep the lines warm. So it's, as you can imagine, like a, um, in your, I don't know if anyone has those old radiators that you used to see in your house where they got warm and if you're close to it, you can pick up some of the heat. It's sort of like that. We run those warm lines by things that can then um, use the heat instead of having to have electrical heaters everywhere. And it's got blankets and radiators and temp sensors and all the other things that Juno has as well. Um, so a little bit more about the spacecraft. This is just a more up-to-date version of the models. So you can see what it looks like. Um, it's kind of built in this modular design. We have the propulsion module, which has the prop tanks and the prop lines and a lot of other things that are attached to it. The radio frequency module, which has um, all the telecom components and the avionics module, which also has a vault, like uh, similar to Juno's, where we put the sensitive um, electronics. The telecom system, it has a high gain antenna and the medium gain, which is more like a flashlight, the low gain, which is more like a light bulb that we talked about. And then fan beam antennas that have kind of a narrow but tall field of view that we use for um, a couple of different reasons. Uh, the brain has the computer and software, and we can have some things that are hard coded in software as behaviors, but also we can send the spacecraft sequences, which is like a file that has a whole bunch of different commands in it in a specific order with specific timing. And then fault protection is the built-in smarts of the spacecraft to know, you know, if X, Y, Z happens in a variety of different scenarios, then I'll do element OP thing to keep the spacecraft safe. I talked a little bit about the propellant system where similar to Juno, we mix a fuel and an oxidizer in order to make combustion. 
but different from Juno. Juno had a bunch of thrusters that it used for attitude control. We have a bunch of thrusters we use for attitude control, but also we use them for our main uh, burns in order to get captured. And for the spacecraft, knowing where it is, it has star trackers and sun sensors, uh, Juno did too. It has an inertial measurement unit, so it can kind of figure out um, if the star tracker is not working, it can kind of integrate up and know where it is based on where it started from. And it also has uh, reaction wheels, which are kind of like these wheels that spin and you can change the speed of them in order to change the orientation of the spacecraft. It's a, it saves fuel when you can do that instead of use the thrusters. Uh, oh, I did put in a slide about the different instruments. So there are a bunch of different things that we are trying to um, detect and then send the data back to, this, to the scientists so that they can then answer some of the questions that they have like a mass spectrometer that'll help us understand the atmospheric composition. It's looking at dust and the contents of the plumes. It has a magnetometer. We talked about that in order to sense more about the, the conductive salty water ocean properties down there. Um, it's looking at the plasma environment around the moon. It has a thermal imager. So it'll let us see if there are places on the ice that are hotter than others. It probably means those are places where the ice is thinner than others. The reason that long antenna, the long ones and the short ones, we use those to determine how thick the ice is, um, all sorts of things going on on the spacecraft to help us characterize the moon and, and start to get at some of those questions, including like the one you guys were just asking. Um, oh, and so, I think that's oh, it. Ooh, yep. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. So Joey asks, uh, how do you determine which behaviors of the spacecraft that have, have to be hard coded compared to other tasks that the spacecraft needs to do? Yeah, that's a good question. And some of the, the ways that we think about it are, if it's a thing that is gonna be done the same way over and over and over, and we know that we can test it really well and the likelihood of us needing to change it in flight is very, very, very low, um, then we would often hard code that as a behavior. And also if it's something that the space trap needs, so say something goes wrong and the space trap is gonna go into safe mode where it turns off all the stuff it doesn't need and tries to respond to an anomaly, right? We like those things to be hard-coded hard as behaviors too. Um, but then for sequences, if it's like a one-time activity, like some kind of event that we wanna do in cruise, or if it's something that isn't absolutely required when we're in safe mode, then we might decide to sequence that. There's a lot more that go into it, but those are kind of two of the big things. Okay, um, and so now we are, we're still in the midst of building the spacecraft. We got through our main critical design review back in December. And now we're doing, uh, we're into the part where we are doing a lot of software testing. And in the spring of next year, we're gonna get into that main assembly and test period where a bunch of components are coming from the Applied Physics Lab, which is our partner on this one. And from a bunch of other places that are building components that we're procuring and we'll be integrating the spacecraft up, putting it together and running it through its cases, both with the flight hardware and also with simulated hardware and engineering model hardware in the test beds, doing a whole bunch of uh, campaigns in order to get it ready to launch in 2024 to be on its merry way to Jupiter. Oh, I lied, I have another slide. <laughs> and so just like I put in a slide on lessons that I learned from Juno, here are some of the lessons that I've learned so far from Clipper on the one year that I've been on board. Um, the importance of planning, obviously, now that I'm the lead flight system engineer in charge of about 40 different people on my team, it's a lot more complex of a team to keep uh, all marching in step and, and ensuring that all the different parts are coming together so that we can meet our schedule for launch. And I joined the project in the middle of the pandemic. So there are lots of people on my team that I have literally never met face to face. We have tons and tons of meetings constantly with lots of people on board in order to do our work together. This is what my home workstation looks like. I like a standing desk with a stool so I can sit down sometimes. Um, and this, this is where I've been the entire time. And we're gonna start going back to work here soon, but we're still finishing up this last period of remote work. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, my job requires a lot of work, but it's important to maintain a good work-life balance. It's not all work and no play. Here are some of the things that I like to do for fun. I get to travel for work. Um, I got to travel out to Italy. I mentioned that our, our GERM instrument was built by the Italian Space Agency. So I went there a few times to coordinate some things with them. And happily, while we're there, you can take a day and run around to go see things. 
Um, I like to do a lot of outreach. I'm talking to you guys. I talk to people of all ages, including college and older folks, but also tiny people. This is a, a classroom of um, four-year-olds <laughs> talking to kids about space, a little, a, a slightly less complicated talk than this one. Um, I like learning new things. The lab likes to teach engineers about the science that the scientists are trying to do, because then that makes us better at understanding their instruments and building spacecraft that are gonna do what is necessary to get their data back. Um, I also travel for fun. This is me going to Costa Rica with my husband and my boss and his wife and a bunch of students from Oregon State University. I'm sorry, it wasn't Oregon State University. It was a school in Oregon. Uh, wow, name is escaping me. That professor was gonna kill me. That was a long time ago. That's my only excuse. <laughs> and then uh, traveling for fun. I got to go uh, to China um, and walk on the Great Wall. Uh, and I like to make art. It's one of the things I do in my hobbies. This is a fused glass project that I did. Hopefully you can tell that's supposed to be Jupiter and the Juno spacecraft and uh, keeping my inner child alive. I think that some adults are just way too serious all the time and you have more fun in life if you can and stay a little bit similar to where you were as a kid, <laughs> even if you are a grown up. Um, so that's it. That's the whole presentation. You guys asked some fantastic questions along the way and I think we've got plenty of time for more Q&A. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn my video, my screen back over so that I can see all of you guys online. All right, so we have a question. Um, how did you overcome your procrastination? <laughs> yeah, that was so hard. I think to be honest with you, it was that super duper scare that I got about maybe not being able to graduate on time and maybe not being able to get my degree like that. That scared the majority of it out of me for real. And it's not like I never ever procrastinate anymore. I think one of the things that I try to do is I always keep a list of things that I need to do. And every day in the morning, I go over it. It's like, what do I need to do today? What do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do for the rest of this week? What needs to get done next week and in, the, in this month and in the next six months? And I review the, day, the weekly one every day and I review the monthly one at least every week. And I think about the long-term one. And it's a reminder that if I don't keep things moving along, like there can be some pretty horrific consequences. And especially now that I'm leading a team, a lot of the times people on my team can't do their work until I give them guidance or make some of the decisions. And so I really can't procrastinate on those things because then it has a cascading effect and slows down a bunch of things. We have another question from Jay asking, would you say your job is more design drawing or hardware, uh, hardware fabrication? Uh, neither, actually. <laughs> my job is like, how do I, how do I explain? Hmm. I'll give you some more examples of things that systems engineers do early on. Like in the early part of a design, we might be thinking about, okay, we have a spacecraft and it's gonna to go to Jupiter. Should we have solar arrays or should we have nuclear power? And there are pros and cons to both things. And you have to think about what those pros and cons are, what impact it has on the design, what impact it has on the instruments. And so it's more of those kinds of bigger picture questions that we're thinking through and trying to resolve. And then when we get later in a mission and we're doing things like, well, let's see if I can give you a good example. Um, mm -hmm, there's some interesting uh, things that we've been working on recently where you have to decide things like, what is gonna be the orientation of your spacecraft versus the angle of your solar arrays? And what does that mean for where the instruments are pointing and the temperature things you're gonna get to? So it's like all of these different interacting impacts that you have to figure out how they all work together and have long conversations with a bunch of different experts to make sure we understood all the impacts, we understood all the consequences, and we're gonna pick the right path to do with something. And so unlike when you think about mechanical engineer, you might think of somebody who's sitting down designing things or like, or assembling hardware. My job is nothing like that, like at all. If you look at my calendar, and this is the part that's a little bit scary. I'm pretty much in wall-to-wall -wall meetings from eight o'clock until five o'clock, sometimes 7.30 to 6.30, but they're not just a person presenting and someone taking notes and that's all the meeting. It's very interactive, conversational. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. What do we need to figure out? What are the next steps we have to do? When do we have to have this figured out by? What's gonna be the fallout if we don't? Like, it's very, a whole bunch of things going on all the time, which in, in my opinion, keeps it super exciting. I, I like that about my job. I like that it requires a lot of interaction with a lot of different people. I like that I'm constantly learning new things all the time and also applying the knowledge that I have. It's really, really fun. All right. So our next question is from Calvin, who asks, 
What are some important yet often overlooked skills in engineering and science as a whole? <laughs> Such a good question. <laughs> and I think it's so funny because the answer that I'm going to give you is going to sound so boring, but I cannot stress how important it is. It's just ridiculous. There's two of them. Number one is communication. <laughs> because when you have a bunch of people trying to design something that's really complex, no single person can understand all the details about all the other things that when you have a thermal person trying to explain to a power person why X, Y, Z thing doesn't work. And if everyone is just talking their specific jargon down at their level and they literally cannot see eye to eye, that's what a systems engineer's job is for. It's almost like the technical, part of it is like the technical translator. It's like this person is saying, here are the problems and this is why that solution won't work. This person is saying, here's the problems and this is why this other solution won't work. Let's figure out where the common ground is. Like, do, do, do we all understand the problem? Do we all understand the options? Do we all understand the fallout? Like, and so being able to communicate and, are, and um, in a way that people who aren't experts in your area can understand is just a big deal. And the second one, which is gonna sound super boring, but I'm telling you, I cannot be overstressed how important it is, is taking notes <laughs> during meetings. Because if you have a meeting with 12 different people, and you're talking about really complicated things, and at the end you decide what steps need to be taken and who's responsible for what and what the timeline is. Nobody takes notes, everybody walks away. Three days later, you have 12 different memories of what happened and what you're supposed to do, like it's a hot mess. And so for me personally, um, I grew up, again, pre-internet, but just when they were starting to develop little chat rooms in school, and so I never learned how to touch type but because I did all that so often, I actually just got really fast and I don't have to look, I can type, I'm not using the right fingers at all. Like it looks ridiculous. Any typing teacher would be horrified, but I can type at like 95 words a minute, which is important because when we're in meetings that I'm running and we're coming up with all these details and new information being shared, I'm like taking copious notes. And at the end of the day, I will spend the time to go clean up the notes, pull out here are the highlights that you have to know about because there's like too long, didn't read. <laughs> so I like, here's the highlights. Here's the actions. Here's who's assigned. Here are the dates. Like, go do your job, people. And if no one's doing that, then you can spend all that time talking about all those things. And it's just wasted because you lose track of what you're supposed to be doing. And so while that sounds like a basic, obvious thing, it's so important to just keep the team moving. And some people will say, you know, well, that sounds secretarial. Like, why are you doing that? I'm like, I could not care less because <laughs> if you are the person who wrote the notes, then you literally are like in control of the history. You were the person who says, this is what happened. This is what we decided, like, go do it. So it's good. Our next question is from Aaron. How important would you say your experience at the Langley Center was for your career in engineering? Oh, that's a great one. Uh, let me see, I have a two part answer probably. I think the thing that was really important about my experience at Langley was getting a chance to interact with real engineers and see what they did in their jobs all day long. And the areas that I worked in are not areas that are super related to the jobs that I took at the lab, because Langley is much more, at least the, the things that I was doing were much more focused on airplanes and not spacecraft. Like I got a chance to work with some folks who were trying to do some testing of a little model of a scramjet engine in a wind tunnel, which was really cool. And some people who were doing like testing of material hardness. So like the technical things didn't really apply, but the things that did apply were learning how professionals communicate with each other and getting a sense that there's such a wide variety of different kinds of jobs that engineers can have. I don't think I really appreciated that. So that when I got to the lab, I just had a better like overall view of that stuff. So, but it was, it was really good. It certainly helped me solidify like, yes, working for NASA is what I want to do. <laughs> so that was all good too. We have another question from Jay asking, uh, as an engineer, how exactly do you work with the scientists studying the information that these missions are collecting? How much does oh, your job require you to focus on the research that comes from these missions? Oh, that's really good. Um, so my job really requires the focus more on the front end about what the scientists want and the things that, so, Oh, let's see. Well, this is going to be a long answer. So there's a bunch of different levels of system engineering. In the talk, I talk mostly about spacecraft and flight system engineering, which is understanding how telecom and power and thermal and all those different things work together so that you have a spacecraft design that works. There's also project system engineering, which is making sure 
the spacecraft and the instruments and the launch vehicle and the mission design and the ground data set, like all those things work together. And I've done uh, like a combo of, of flight and project on Juno and MRO and mostly project on Kepler, all project on Psyche and on Clipper, I'm doing flight <laughs> level. And the thing that is important with, with me and, and engineers who do my job understanding the science is because like, how do I put this? I'll give you an example. Like say you have an instrument that is trying to measure something on Europa. And in order to do the measurement, it has to know where it's pointed, like where it's oriented very, very well, because say it's mapping the magnetic field. If when they get their data back, they can't say, and at the time this data was taken, the spacecraft was oriented this way and over the moon this way, then they won't be able to put together a map of the magnetic field. So me understanding that is important because it means well, we have to make sure we're designing the spacecraft and the attitude control system, like how it knows where it is, to a certain level of accuracy so we can tell them how accurately they were pointed so they can use that to make their map and, and make the data work. So we have to understand some things like that in order to support the additional engineering data they need to make use of their science data. And then on the back side, when they're getting their science data, um, if everything goes fine, <laughs> then we don't need to be that involved. But when we have anomalies, something goes wrong with the spacecraft or with an instrument, sometimes we can use the science data to help understand the anomalies. Like say the spacecraft is in orbit around Jupiter and then it reboots, like your computer reboots sometimes. And we're like, well, what happened there? Well, we have information on the spacecraft that we can use to try to understand. But if the science instruments are taking data, and they saw, well, we had a big spike in particle count. We were like, oh, well, maybe something's going on in the environment that made the spacecraft reboot. So there's, there can be a little bit of a tie that way too. All right. Uh, our next question is from Calvin who asks, what is your favorite Mars rover? Oh, do I have a favorite Mars rover? Hmm. Do I have a favorite Mars rover? I never thought about that before. I, I might say because, uh, and this is just going to be like, like uh, hearkening back to one of the missions that I did. So since I was on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and we took a lot of images of the ground and we did a lot of relay for the rovers on the ground, we have a really cool picture of the Opportunity Rover when it was around the edge of the Victoria Crater. I actually had this one blown up really big, like, like four feet across on the wall in my house. <laughs> because in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter picture, you can see like uh, the little the little dot or a, it's a handful of pixels that is the rover and you can see the shadow from the camera mask you can see its little um, tracks from the path it took to get up there so it's really cool just because my spacecraft took a picture of it so that one might be my favorite. <laughs> um, our next question is from Andrew. So with regards to your time in college you mentioned that you had pursued mechanical engineering over aeronautics um, now that you have more experience, in what ways do you feel that that has been advantageous or disadvantageous for you? And do you have any thoughts on tangentially related majors like astrophysics? Yeah, so let's see. I think that for me personally, the mechanical engineering degree was good because it gave me a very broad foundation and some very detailed areas, especially when I decided to go do my graduate degree in vibrations and controls. And some of that applies to me understanding what it is that our guidance, navigation, and control engineers are doing with our attitude control system, for example. Um, so it was advantageous in that way. I think that an aerospace degree or an aeronautics degree would have given me earlier exposure to what spacecraft are and all the different components on them. Because literally when I was interviewing for the job at JPL and they're like, um, so are you interested in systems engineering? And I'm all, so what's that? <laughs> and they had to describe the job to me. And when, when I got hired on, there was a lot of learning that I was doing about even the different components of the spacecraft and how they all fit together. And there's reasons why JPL like still finds it fine to hire people who studied aerospace and also mechanical or also electrical, like all, all the different things are important for us here. But, um, and so while there are pros and cons, if I had to go back and do it again, I wouldn't do anything differently, but if someone made me made me go back and do aerospace, I also think that would have worked out fine. Um, and oh, curses, I've forgotten the second part of your question. What was the second part? Or did I get the whole thing? Um, do you have any thoughts on other um, majors like astrophysics? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so one of the things that's cool about places like JPL and also Lockheed Martin and the companies that do deep space missions like this, like Ball Aerospace and, and Boeing, um, and there's lots of more, I, I know I'm leading out a ton of them, SpaceX and all the new ones. Um, there are so many different things that 
all of our different people need to be able to do that there's a vast variety of majors you could do in college that all apply. And there are the obvious ones. There's mechanical, there is um, electrical that I mentioned, our spacecraft have like so many electrical systems. There's robotics, there's aeronaut, like uh, aerospace, obviously like so many different engineering disciplines that you could study. There's also computer science. There's a whole bunch of different um, science disciplines. I know people who do engineering or science with a physics and astrophysics degree. And even things that aren't in the sciences, like we have people whose whole focus is business, right? Like they have a, a business or accounting degree because like these missions cost money <laughs> and we have to keep track of what we're doing. And there's contracts and procurement. I know that we have people on staff at Caltech who are lawyers because there's lots of space policy stuff we have to do. We have people who work at the lab who are artists and they have full-time jobs to generate like all these artist conceptions things that you see and also installations around the lab and stuff for public outreach there are teachers who are involved in all the outreach stuff we have people who study journalism and they're in media like there's there's so many things because it takes a village to do all these jobs that almost anything you can think of that you're interested in and you want to study i bet there's a way to tie it to something to do with space which is great in my opinion so we have a question from Rom asking, since you worked on the Kepler mission, do you know what NASA or you personally took away from working around Ke uh, Kepler's broken repair wheel? Oh yeah, so I actually left the mission before that one reaction wheel failed. So let's see, what did we take away from it? I, I was really impressed that when, um, let's see, there were multiple wheels on the spacecraft, there, so there was a redundant one. So when the first wheel was broken, uh, we were able to use the, the team that remained because I was only on it for like 60 days into launch. The team was able to um, still continue the mission the way that it had been going. And then when they lost another one and went down to two, they were only able to control the spacecraft in a couple of different axes, but they came up with this brilliant way to use the solar wind in order to kind of tack into the solar wind and still do a mission. Now they couldn't, they pointed at the same patch of stars all the time, like we had been doing in the previous mission, they had to like stay pointed at one patch of stars for, I think, I think it was probably like maybe three months at a time and then change the attitude and look at a different place for three months at a time. But they were able to use the solar wind to control the spacecraft attitude enough to point well enough at those different patches in order to continue finding shorter um, orbiting planets, planets with shorter years, um, which was amazing. Like I, I could not believe they did that. And there's all sorts of other things that they were able to still study too like about supernovas and stars. And so it was really a, a great exercise in engineering creativity to continue that mission longer, even past the failure of two wheels. And I know that um, the mission ultimately did end when there were more failures. And this is where whenever we have a component failure, we work with the, the vendor who, who made those wheels to look back and say, okay, what happened? <laughs> like, why did that happen? And what is it that we might need to, to modify in the design or in manufacturing the wheels in order to make sure that, they're, that that kind of failure doesn't happen in the future? So it wouldn't surprise me if, if you guys haven't heard of something called the NASA Lessons Learned Database. It's a database that is put together with things that we've learned from anomalies that happen in, in space missions. And it's out there for anyone in the public to look at. Because the idea is we want all the aerospace companies and anybody who's interested to know what happened, why it happened, what we did about it, how, how you can avoid that sort of thing. And it wouldn't, I haven't gone to look, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's something about that particular one that landed in the lessons learned database. All right. So Katrina asks, do you ever change the path of a spacecraft's mission depending on new information you receive? For example, if you discover a surprising fact, would you ever try to plan another flyby at that location, even if it wasn't planned before the launch? A hundred percent. Yes, indeed. And I know that that for a fact happened um, a couple of times on Juno. Like we flew over the great red spots. There were some really interesting things we learned about it. Um, after I left the mission, I think they put in another great red spot flyby over it. Now, the things that are complicated is they were trying to build up a, um, a full global map of the magnetic field. And so you definitely needed to fly by at an even space, a whole bunch of different spots on the planet. Um, and then they got an extended mission. And so they're able to now choose different things that they are going to do. I haven't been plugged in enough to the mission in order to understand exactly what went into where they're deciding to go by now. Um, and then I'll give you another example. Um, on the Dawn mission, which is not a mission that I worked on, that spacecraft went to go visit an asteroid. It had a really successful 
mission and then they got an extended mission and they were able to use it because it was a solar electric propulsion mission to go visit another asteroid. So it was a whole different second kind of mission that they were able to get out of that based on uh, an opportunity of where the other asteroid was. So yeah, so things like that definitely happened. So our next question is, how might Jupiter's radiation affect life on Europa? Yeah, oh, great question. I actually looked that one up <laughs> a few months ago because um, the radiation field is so strong that our understanding of life means that anything that's on the surface of Europa would just be toasted, right? <laughs> but, but ice and water is a really good protector from radiation. So my, at least my reading of an article online, you guys will want to go do some, some Google researching of your own, that it only takes a few inches of ice to be protective enough that if there were biological signatures of some sort down below the first few inches, they should be intact and not destroyed by the radiation. And so as far as we know, especially down under the 15 to 25 kilometers of ice and then under multiple kilometers, kilometers of water, down at the, at the bottom of the ocean, um, the radiation should not be, the radiation that Jupiter is putting out should not be able to reach down there and, and harm the life form. So that's cool. A question from Sarah asking, what challenges did you face slash overcome when beginning your new projects virtually during the pandemic? <laughs> oh my God, so many. It's kind of comical, really. So even if we had not been virtual, it is always challenging to move to a new project because you have to learn all about the team and all about the mission and all about the issues that we're trying to resolve. Like, holy cow. And when I joined um, Clipper in July, uh, we were heading into a critical design review, which is like one of the most major things that we do. It's where it's a five day review. It's eight hours long and every different part of the project, people have to stand up and explain, here's all these details of what we're doing. Here's all the issues we know about. This is what we're gonna do about them. This is why we think we're gonna meet our schedule. But like, it's just a huge thing. And so me taking over the flight system engineering team, I had to come up to speed on all of those things and like lead the team through a critical, it was just crazy. I feel like I didn't sleep <laughs> for that whole six months and do it all virtually. So it meant not being able to have the like um, the random bump into people in the hallways and ask them this or that. Like you really had to put in a lot more effort just to keep the communication channels open. We have a lot of different um, chat tools so we can be chatting with each other. Like I know we have the chat session here that we are not using, <laughs> but um, you have to create ways and be more proactive about staying in touch with people. So that was, that was rough. I think the, the hardest thing was just having that huge review in front of us and getting to know the team and the spacecraft and all of the different issues we had to work and, and moving the design maturity along through that six period or through that six month period. Yeah, crazy. I'm looking forward to getting back to normal <laughs> when we all go back to work. All right, so our next question is also from Sarah. And she asks, why does the orbit of the Juno spacecraft slowly move downward? Yeah, and it's because um, of the, the pull of Jupiter's gravity. It just, it has an effect of uh, adjusting the trick. Now we could, we, if we had enough fuel, right? We could have counteracted that by using maneuvers on the spacecraft, but that would have been very, very fuel intensive. And we would have had to have a bigger spacecraft. It would have been hard to get the spacecraft all the way out there. And so we just allow that to naturally happen. Uh, question from Tanvi who asks, in the future, what kinds of missions would you like to be involved in? Yeah, oh, another great question, which is, which is interesting because at this point in my career, having done a Mars orbiter and an exoplanet mission and a Jupiter orbiter and an asteroid mission. And this one, like, I feel like I've been hopping my little way around the solar system. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure yet, yet. Like Europa is a really, it's such a cool place to go to that I haven't yet thought beyond Europa and what other things I might want to do in the future. But I do like, um, I really just like getting to learn new things about new places and also um, participate with different engineers across the mission. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have a favorite on my list. I've ticked off so many of them <laughs> so far. We have two questions from Chanel uh, asking, A, what is your biggest regret? And B, what is your least favorite planet and why? <laughs> biggest regrets, let's see. I think like, so big might be strong. So I'll talk about it this way. So. 
To become a really competent systems engineer, there are a couple of different paths. Well, there's probably like 50 paths, but there's it kind of bifurcates in two main ways. You can either um, start in systems engineering and stay in systems engineering your whole career, like I wound up doing, but both at the project level and flight system, I talked about those two differences. Um, or you can spend some time working in a specific targeted area. Like you can spend a lot of time working in thermal or in attitude control system or whatever. And I had always intended along my career to go spend some time in one of those subsystems, we call it, and be a little closer to the hardware development or maybe some software development and, and fault protection. And it just didn't work out that way because the way your opportunities come up to go do other things is a little random, really. Um, whether an opportunity comes up or your supervisor recommends you do something. So my opportunity on MRO, since we have time, I'll tell you this story. Um, I, was, I was doing something else when I first started. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but um, I had started to get to know a bunch of different people. And the person who was the project system engineer on MRO, just as that mission was getting selected and we were forming the partnership with Lockheed Martin said, hey, you know, I, I met you when you came to talk to me about blah, blah, blah. I'm putting together my project system engineering team. I need some experienced people and it's fine for me to have a couple of fairly new people. Do you wanna come work on this project? And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> and so that was kind of random. And, and on that one, I wound up working half time for that person at the project system level and half time for someone else at the flight system level, which was a great mix because you got to see at the project level, really big picture issues that stretched across the spacecraft and the instruments and the mission design and all of that. But then also things at the flight system level that were like how we interact between the thermal system and telecom and, and attitude control and all that stuff. So I stayed on MRO for about six years, four years prior to launch and two years post-launch, which was great because you got to learn a lot about the spacecraft and the team and how it all works. And by the time I got to the end, I had learned enough and enough people had left that I became the lead system engineer with a com combined Lockheed Martin JPL team. And then as I, I, I wasn't planning to go anywhere, like we were still doing some cool things in the mission, but someone came knocking on my door to say, we're trying to you know, increase some staffing on Kepler. You have some experience we think would be relevant in this way. Would you like to come work on this mission? I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Let me go do that. And that was at the project system level. And then I knew I was going to roll off Kepler like only two months after launch because that's when our team's portion ended. And that's when the Juno team was staffing up and they said, hey, you worked on MRO. Juno has lots of similar char characteristics to MRO. It would be great to add you to our team. Do you want to come work on this? Yes, I do. So I wound up doing flight system and project system on Juno. And I had no intention of leaving Juno, even though I had been on there for nine years. And I did a little bit of thing, something else half time along the way, but I'll spare you those details. And then I was still like, we had all sorts of interesting stuff going on because we had some anomalies that were fun to resolve. But then someone came and said, hey, um, I know that people over on Psyche are staffing up. You should go throw your name in the hat for one of those positions. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. So I ran around and talked to a bunch of different people and put my name in the hat for the deputy project system engineering position and got selected for that. And I started that in 2018. And you know, we were still well, not launched yet. <laughs> and my intention was to stick around on Psyche at least to launch and maybe into operations when someone came knocking on my door saying, hey, <laughs> like this position on Europa Clipper is coming open and we think you're great, why don't you go do that? And so because it happened that way, there was never a time that I was like ready to leave something and thought, well, now would be a great time for me to go work on an attitude control. Let's go do like, it just didn't happen. And since I'm 20 years into my career now, and at the point where I'm leading a team of engineers doing this, I've, I've aged out a little bit. <laughs> like it doesn't make sense for me to go do a, now teach me how to do attitude control down at a lower level. So like, it is what it is now. And so sometimes I used to feel like I, I'm, I'm really, I'm getting to your question. I used to feel like I regretted that. Like I wanted to go spend some time in the trenches in a subsystem because there's lots of really interesting things you can learn. But as a system engineer who stays at the system level for a long time, you end up learning a lot about a lot of the different areas because of the anomalies that happen. Whenever something goes wrong, you have to penetrate really deep with the experts in exactly how is that thing supposed to work? Why didn't it work that way? And so in 20 years of doing a lot of development anomaly resolution, I've developed a lot of technical depth in the areas where we tend to have the most anomalies on those particular missions that I've been working on. Um, so that was part one of your question. What are the things that I regret? And part two, oh, I forgot part two. Least part favorite, two. least favorite planet. Oh, say it again one more time. Sorry, least favorite planet. Oh, least favorite planet. <laughs> Do I have a least favorite planet? Uh, least favorite, least favorite. 
I never thought about it that way before. Hmm. If I had to choose, maybe mercury, just too hot. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, we probably just we just have time for one more question. So pick a good one. <laughs> I'm they're all good. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, Joey <laughs> asks, uh, given all of the projects that you've worked on throughout your career, uh, which one do you feel you've learned from the most? Oh, wow. That's another good one. No one has phrased it exactly that way. Which one have I learned from the most? Wow. I'm going to cheat and give you an answer. That's not just one. Um, I mean, I learned an incredible amount on MRO, mainly because like I didn't know anything <laughs> when I started MRO and being on that project for six years to me felt like I was really learning the ropes of what the system engineering job is and the way that we do it here at the lab. And the fact that I could go from brand new person on team to leading the system engineering team in six years was kind of a big deal. So that was a huge learning curve, learned a ton on that mission. But I will say that being on, um, so being on Juno for such a long time, I learned a whole bunch of things on that one too. But I think Clipper has been the thing that has let me see how fast I can learn a lot of information because going from joining a new team and now a lot of the a lot of the things that I know about systems engineering in general apply directly to Clipper, which is one of the reasons why they wanted me to come and take this job. But having to come up to speed on just an insane variety of technical details in a short period of time and then get up and present on all that stuff at uh, critical design review was was a huge challenge. And like, I, I'm not going to lie, I'm super proud of myself for surviving through that. And I felt like I learned a lot doing that. Okay, wonderful. Um, unfortunately, they, they do have to get to learning blocks or social blocks. Otherwise, we could go on forever, probably. It's been so interesting, Tracy. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for your time. Um, and we thank New Mexico Tech for being here as usual. Uh, is there any last words, Tracy, or anything before we say thank you? <laughs> yeah, I'll just say thanks for having me. And I'm, I am so impressed at the caliber of questions that you guys all had. Like a lot of those are ones I'd heard for the first time or just articulated in a way that was very specific and like demonstrates a knowledge of some of the technical details behind all the things I was telling you. So it's been really, really fun having this conversation with you and, uh, Thanks again. It's been great. Well, we sure have enjoyed you. Thank you so much. Everybody go ahead and unmute and, and thank Tracy for her time today. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.